Staffio Now is presented by Northwest Financial Advisors, where our world revolves around you. This is Jim Hughes. Normally at this point, I would say, welcome to AFIO Now. But we have decided to change up the art form and the distribution scheme just a little bit and do something different. On occasion, when circumstances warrant, we are going to fast track a particular topic when the issue and a really expert presenter warrants that. And I think you'll find that today's topic and our expert presenter more than warrant. The speaker and I are old friends and former colleagues. We served for many years together in CIA's Near East and South Asia Division, where we dealt with a lot of these very prickly issues. Norm Rule is a former CIA operations officer, 34 years, 15 years of service uh, overseas, served in a number of senior capacities uh, in headquarters as a division chief and a deputy division chief. For the last nine, almost 10 years of his career, he was the national intelligence manager at the DNI for Iran. Today, he is a business consultant on Middle East economic, security, political, and energy issues, and he is much sought after. And so I'm particularly grateful that Norm has agreed to come on today. Norm, welcome to AFIO's special edition. Good morning, Jim. It's a pleasure to be with you again. And in, in, in addition to describing our relationship together, you were my mentor for many years, and any successes I had in my career were often based on the lessons you taught me. Well, I'm, I'm delighted to see uh, you and others how successful you have become, because many in Washington know that uh, Norm really is one of our nation's real experts in Iran and is called downtown quite often to consult on that issue. Normal, the temptation is to jump immediately into the headlines on Iran and its surrogates. I think for at least part of our audience, it would be helpful to look backwards a little bit and share with them some of the history of the most violent attacks that Iranian surrogates have conducted against uh, U.S. installations and U.S. forces? It's a great question. And uh, at the risk of stating something you and I both know is the obvious, that I'll keep it relatively short because going through the list would be quite long. I, I'm sometimes surprised that we've become inured, we've become used to these attacks. We often forget how deep and various and multiple these attacks have been in so many locations. From the initiation of the Islamic Republic, their Revolutionary Guard, and later the Quds Force, when that entity was created, undertook attacks in Lebanon, the attacks on our embassy in 1983, the Beirut barracks bombing, but also bombings in Kuwait against our embassy, hijacking of airlines of Kuwait and TWA involving surrogate actors, uh, attempted assassination of Middle Eastern leaders, the Kuwaiti leadership attempting to overthrow the government of Bahrain on at least three occasions. The list is really quite broad. And then you, that's only really the 80s. Once you get into the 90s, you get into the, the bombing of the Israeli embassy in Argentina, the Jewish Community Center in Argentina. Again, more airline attacks, the Hobar bombings in 1996, which killed 19 servicemen, many from Greensburg, Pennsylvania, near my, my home in southwestern Pennsylvania. And that's before you get into the Iraq war, where surrogates of Iran's Quds Force killed hundreds, more than 600 U.S. servicemen and women and uh, partners, as well as wounding thousands. And it's the wounds we often don't talk about, uh, the Borges bombing by Lebanese Hezbollah. It's really an extraordinary list. And then you have the threats against uh, um, U.S. nationals and others in the homeland itself. We have a, a recent prosecution that's been announced in the last week. This follows on news of attempts attempted attacks against U.S. officials and private sector individuals, an attempt to kidnap oppositionists in the United States. Um, it's really a very, very long and almost constant drumbeat of aggression against the global community. Over this 40-year um, history, how has Iran's use of surrogates evolved? Well, it's evolved considerably. 
And uh, this is a, a good place for Iran to operate because Iran sees that the international community doesn't have a great uh, strategy to deal with gray zone or hybrid warfare attacks. And hybrid war are basically multidimensional activities that an, that an adversary would undertake to alter someone's behavior, but these these actions, which can be lethal, remain below the threat, the level that would invoke a conventional military response. And this characterizes Iran's behavior. Its use of surrogates has really fallen into, I'd say, four stages. We're in the fourth right now. The first began working with and learning from Palestinian militants, the anti-Western, anti-U.S., anti-Israel basis for Palestinian militants uh, found considerable resonance in Iran. Then you have the creation of the Quds Force around 1989, a paramilitary terrorist organization. And what your listeners should understand is this is a challenge for the West because this is a formal military organization that wear uniforms, but they're terrorists. And to deal with terrorists, well, we have a well, we have a standard, but to deal with a formal military, we have to declare war against a country. So this has allowed Iran to operate with surrogates in that environment. The Iran-Iraq war had a powerful impact on Iran's doctrine regarding surrogates. Iran found that it had no real allies. It had no great technology. It didn't have great finances, but it had the potential for proxy forces, and that became part of its power projection. It it's, works with a variety of partners. It's not just Shia militants. They have worked with not only such Sunnis as Hamas, as we're seeing today, the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, but it lost in the history. If you go back to, say, 1995, there was public reporting that the Quds Force met with the Japanese Red Army, the Armenian Secret Army, the Kurdistan Workers' Party. It really is quite a list. That was the initial period of, of Iraq, the first stage. The second stage was really the Iraq War. And what happened there was that Quds Force officers operated with surrogates and killed Americans and Iraqis and others in, in, in that conflict and faced very little pushback. And it allowed them to build up a political narrative that they can get away with a lethal attacks against the West and indeed seem victorious at times. Your third stage was the Arab Spring for Iran and its proxies, and that was a mixed bag. They were responding to threats that looked capable of overwhelming the Syrian government, their only real ally. Here you see a dramatic expansion of Quds Force activities to the region. But many of these activities failed, and there was a victory by the region in the West as they were not able to overthrow any of the monarch Gulf monarchies. They were not able to be successful in Egypt or other locales, but they did embed themselves in in the failed states or the failing states. And what you saw in this third stage with proxies was that Iran needs basically four things briefly to succeed with proxies as a, as a, as a political actor. It must operate in a failed or failing state. You need some version of a beleaguered population that has a Shia relationship, however distant. You need militia or security actors willing to take Iranian equipment, training, and direction as part of their survival and, and political expansion. You also need no external actor that's willing to push back. In Iraq, we knew the Iranians were killing our forces. It was our collective position with the West that we would not take Iran on at that time. But last and perhaps most importantly, you need a logistics pipeline. And the size and freedom of that pipeline tells you what Iran is going to be able to do there. The latest stage, which we've seen with the October 7th and attacks afterwards, is that Iran is basically operationalizing proxies across the very wide geography against an even wider geography. It's not just Yemen. But we're talking the Gulf of Aden. We're talking the Red Sea. We're talking about very new weapons. 10 years ago, 20 years ago, if I were to say that the, the Yemenis would fire medium range ballistic missiles on multiple countries, we would have said there's going to be an international war and we'll probably be involved. It didn't happen. We've normalized the use of many of these weapons. The Iranians now routinely touch global energy and trade targets. And this began when they were attacking Saudi and Emirati ships some years back. And last, you have a series of actors who are positioned by the Iranians so that they have their malign capabilities and then can justify this based on a narrative at the time. 
So you often hear in Iraq that the attacks by Iraqi surrogates against the U.S., which killed three of our service men and women uh, just yesterday, were based on Israel. But there were 90 attacks against those personnel before October 7th. So this is a very different stage we're in right now. Norm, you uh, anticipated my next question a little bit. How have the new technologies impacted uh, the use of surrogates? And well, that's a, that's a great question because Iran has always employed technologies that are both specific to the nature of the battlefield in which the proxy operates, specific to the technological sophistication of the proxy, but also all of Iran's technologies tend to result in mass civilian casualties. So let's go back into the history a little bit. Car bombs were among the most popular weapons that Iran gave its Lebanese surrogates and, and others in the Gulf and, and elsewhere. Uh, again, mass casualties don't require a tremendous amount of training, don't require a tremendous amount of precision, very high profile. In Iraq, you had explosive form projectiles, which Iran had to provide because the machining of the devices required a capability that didn't exist with Iraqi surrogates, but Iran could bring these in through that logistics pipeline and, and enable them, teach them how to use them. Improvised rocket-assisted munitions, again, firing something into a civilian area. And then when you move to the Houthis, and you're watching missiles, rockets, and drones, most of which, the vast majority of which are always fired against civilian targets. There is certainly a lot of attention paid to the, the, the terrible impact of the Gaza war on Palestinian civilians. But often lost is that Hamas has fired since October 7th, 12,000 rockets at Israeli civilians. That's an extraordinary number. And if you look at the hundreds of ballistic missiles and drones fired by the Houthis against Saudi Arabia and Yemen, the vast majority, probably more than 90 percent, were aimed at civilian population centers, energy centers as their next uh, as their next topic. One of the reasons you have this common thread is that the Quds Force basically has a, a template for how it deals with proxies. I call it a cookie cutter approach, although it's dealing with different dough and sometimes a different baking time because of the, the training requirements that go into something. So let's go back to the missiles for a moment. Iran not only provides the Houthis with missiles, which the Houthis have used against civilian sailors as well as military ships, but it's provided training in Iran and in Yemen on how to build and use those weapons. So Iran has lifted the sophistication of its partners. Last, Iran has taken other proxies who have linguistic capabilities to train other partners. So you have Lebanese Hezbollah, you trained on missiles and car bombs and a whole variety of weapons, training the Houthis because they speak Arabic and they're able to sustain a revolutionary narrative. So you're watching weapons of mass destruction, civilian targets, consistent technology played out. The one technology that is often not, not seen with this, this, this group is cyber. Most of Iran's proxies don't have a great cyber capability. Some, Lebanese Hezbollah, some of the Palestinian actors have a modest capability. But Iran is able to use its own cyber, offensive cyber industry, masking it as Houthi or Palestinian or Iraqi, and then attack a variety of Western or regional targets. Norm, in your view, is the U.S. facing a more dangerous threat today than ever before? I think it might be more precise to say that the existing threat with capabilities we have well understood are being operationalized differently because the West has tolerated the use of these weapons in a more aggressive manner. There is very little that we're seeing that hasn't been public knowledge for many, many years. The Houthi missile attacks, again, they conducted hundreds in drone attacks against multinational populations in Saudi Arabia and the Emirates. The idea that Hamas would use a similar attack against a multinational population in Israel, it's not a surprise. 30 Americans died in the October 7th uh, massacre. Uh, we easily could have had Americans dying in Saudi Arabia or the Emirates. The other twist I would put on this is, just as we're facing a more serious threat, I think one of the 
One of the challenges is that our technology, our counter technology has also improved significantly. And there's a danger in that for us. So you've seen, and I think we should all applaud, the heroism and skill of US and partner forces in bringing down hundreds of Iranian missiles and drones. The Saudi, uh, prior to Ukraine, the Saudi air defense uh, system was the most successful and experienced on the planet because of they had had the most attacks from any actor using missiles and drones. And we've watched in the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aden, uh, Iraq, our forces with amazing success until yesterday's tragedy, shoot weapons down. But this has created maybe a sense of overconfidence. And, and I don't mean to denigrate any policy decision or policymaker on this, but we sort of put our forces and our partner forces in a cruel lottery saying, we think you've got what you need to defend yourself and we'd like you to catch drones and missiles for the foreseeable future. Uh, that's a tough thing to ask of our uh, national treasure, our war fighters in these faraway places. Norm, in your view, what are the options, costs and consequences of U.S. action or inaction against this threat? Right. So I think the hard bottom line is to say right now, American servicemen and partners are under a lethal threat. We need to recognize that in that cruel lottery, Americans serving their country today could be dead tomorrow. Just stare in the mirror and say it. This is because we have not deterred our adversary. Defense, degradation of capability is not deterrence. And that's that. If we were to undertake action, I think you have a number of people to say, well, let's hit Iran. Let's hit somebody. That's, that's not a bad idea, but I think we need to hurry up and slow down, as we would put it in the in our old days. We must have a bipartisan approach to this. Our adversary does not measure our threat by our capability. It knows, the Iranians and the Houthis and others know, our military is vastly beyond their capabilities in defense but they measured on our intent and our, their sense of our national will and fortitude. We simply must have a bipartisan approach to this. We also must be supported by key partners. And that includes Europeans who generally tend to eschew military and kinetic activity in favor of a stiffly worded statement or, or sanctions. Last, we must be willing to demonstrate that we're in this for the long term. Given the history of recent years, you often will have policymakers say everything is on the table, all options are on the table. Well, when the Trump administration deployed some of those options and the Iranians responded, you had some political voices say the region's more dangerous. And that is a gift to the Iranians and the adversaries. We have to show if they cross a red line, we will be supported by partners and have the national will to defend that equity and to keep defending it until they stop against an adversary that will try to get to produce civilian casualties, to include threats in the homeland to touch our, our national debate. The last thing I would say is that sanctions are often brought up. And you will sometimes hear the phrase that, or the, the idea that sanctions are overused. That's certainly not the case. What is the case is that less meaningful sanctions are now routine. It is routine to hear that the United States or Britain in the past week, for example, have sanctioned a number of entities. That does have a corrosive effect on business interest in dealing with Iran and other actors. But if the sanctions target individuals with no assets abroad, no real assets on the inside, no use of international financial systems, they don't travel and the regime doesn't want them to travel. We can't suggest that this is changing leadership decision making. So whatever our options are, we have to begin up front and saying, what will we do that touches leadership decision making? That's a serious issue. And, and in the end of the day, that means that we have to take risk. If we don't, we're not constraining the ally, the adversaries. But we have to be honest and say, we've constrained ourselves. We've contained ourselves. And what we have created with the current situation is by tolerating hundreds of attacks against our forces over the past two years, we have created the lowest deterrence state in my memory. And as I look at the history of the region, and I try trying to avoid hyperbole, but I don't think we've had such weak deterrence since the earliest days of the Barbary pirates. And 
adversaries are now able to conduct repeated lethal aggression over a very broad geography. I mean, just some your your listeners should pull out a map and just look at the Arabian Sea, Red Sea, Iraq, Gaza. That's an amazing amount of geography. And we're playing whack a militia. And our response again is degradation or defense. We're also messaging because of what we're doing to our partners that if we don't respond to 150 attacks on our own forces with something that really creates deterrence, and stands up for our forces, should they believe that we're going to stand with them to attacks in their forces? And I think that really leads to a, the broader two points, which are China and Russia are watching. If we're not defending the Red Sea, one of the most critical arteries, maybe the most critical artery, trade artery in the world, given its proximity to the Strait of Hormuz and the Suez Canal, uh, are we willing to defend the Strait of Taiwan, the Malacca Straits? And that, I think, is, is starting to cause a, a breakdown of partnerships and alliances. I think we're in the early days of that. But if you look at the alliance structure of the Red Sea, it's an interesting, it's an interesting group. And, and not to go too far into this, in some ways, what we're seeing is a very 19th century response by some actors. In the 19th century, countries protected only their own shipping. They would help out someone under an attack by a pirate if they saw it and wanted to help, but that wasn't their job. We're watching some countries in the Red Sea, China, perhaps even the French, say, we're not part of coalitions to, for regional security, but we are there for own forces. And the reason that becomes inefficient is the French, for example, don't have a Navy large enough to cover the entire region, let alone the world. And even ourselves with our 11 aircraft carrier task forces, we've got a lot of work in the world to undertake. So I, I'm, I am concerned that this, this action and non-action has significant consequences that we don't quite understand. Well, and finally, how could U.S. actions impact third country relationships, the balance of power, and the world economy? That's a great question. So building on what I said before, I think in sort of basic economics, if you look at multipolarity, multipolarity creates multiple systems where there used to be one system. That introduces air gaps between the systems. That introduces new, new inefficiencies. That introduces more cost. And that also limits growth because you're not cooperating, you're not working together. That's basic economics. The same thing happens in basic politics. So if we want our partners to stand with us in a variety of areas, and they're not standing with us on this sort of threat, it, it does beg the question of, you know, can we ask the Gulf partners to do more with us against Russia and China if they don't feel comfortable doing more with us against a threat to them? Likewise, the, the Emiratis were public with their, that they were incandescent, that the United States took so long to respond to what they described with good reason as their 9-11 attack. Can we ask countries to stand with us if we're not there for a 9-11 attack for them? When you look at the economic ripples that are coming from this event, it's easy to say that right now the uh, ship, the, the, the shift with container traffic will touch our economy. Uh, for example, uh, shipping between Shanghai and Los Angeles now has uh, in, seen the cost for a 20-foot box, 20-foot, the, the, the transport boxes you see on ships or the 40-foot size increased by 30%. Now, there's no Middle East in the Pacific, but the ships that would be available for that are now elsewhere in the world, picking up the slack from the many ships who have to go around Africa. We're watching costs increase in Europe for shipping by as much as 100%. Insurance rates going from $10,000 to a $1 million for a ship. Some ships, your insurance companies saying, we're not going to insure a US, UK, or Israel company if they have interest in the shipping in the region, which creating a strange situation where US forces might be defending the ships of non-American actors to include China. I think you're watching this, 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 this raise prices, but the inflationary aspect of what it's doing for America and Europe is probably going to be offset heavily by the deflationary steps being undertaken as people are looking at lower interest rates, recessions, some unemployment is coming around. I think the, the greater threat is with emerging and developing economies. 
Egypt, which is a very fragile economy, very fragile, it's one of the most worrisome things in the Middle East today, has lost hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue from Suez Canal shipping. It isn't going through the Suez Canal. We're watching countries like Sri Lanka and other emerging companies that would send ore, minerals, textiles, foodstuffs through the Red Sea now face much higher costs and competition from other areas. So if you're going to buy a commodity, do you buy it from Brazil that can get to you faster? Or do you buy it from somewhere in Africa or Malaysia or Asia that transits a broader distance? Last, this is not an efficient system. So the ships that are going around Africa, not only add a week to the United States, 10 to two weeks, 21 days even to parts of Europe, but they've got to stop for fuel somewhere in the middle. And those refueling stations, the gas stations of South Africa in Durban, Port Louis, for example, were never designed or architectured to refuel so many ships. Let me pull one more thread. This is actually occurring at a very delicate time for global shipping. The Panama Canal is enduring a significant drought, and that drought has reduced the uh, level of water, and that's limited the, the size and the number of ships that can transit the canal. We're entering a time of the year when that water in the Panama Canal drops another four feet, and that further limits, again, the number and type of ships that go to the Panama Canal. So we're watching shipping, just-in-time delivery of goods be fractured by this event. I'll we'll circle back to, we're watching Iran having created a series of actors that are now able to touch the global economy. And Iran pays no penalty for this because the international community does not have the partnerships and the structure and the, the paradigm of saying, um, you, we will punish Iran in a way that its leadership feels most relevant to uh, stop this action. Fascinating. Well, this has been a very informative and timely presentation. I want to thank my good friend, Norm Rule, for coming on today. My pleasure. Thank you, Jim. I always learn an awful lot from you. Maybe not to be as brief a briefer as uh, the world would like, but as I say, there are a lot of people in the intelligence community today and in, in many years who owe you for your many lessons and your example. Thank you. Take care. AFIO is a small, nonprofit, apolitical, educational organization whose main mission is to help prepare the next generation of intelligence officers to confront the challenges our nation faces in the years ahead. To learn more or support our outreach programs, visit www.afio.com.